Today in Across the Fence, our special series looks at the final charge in the Battle of Gettysburg as we learn about a little-known fight that took place after the Confederate defeat. And we'll go behind the scenes to see how this series was produced. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today we wrap up our series on the Battle of Gettysburg, which ended on July 3rd, 1863. 150 years ago today. Before we talk about the last day of the fighting at Gettysburg, I'm joined by Across the Fence associate producer Keith Silva. I have to say, this is a beautifully shot and edited series. You well, did thank a great you. job. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it took a lot of work, though. It took a lot of work. Uh, it was off. It was a special occasion uh, for Across the Fence. Uh, how, it was Howard Coffin's idea, Howard mm -hmm. said the sesquicentennial. Uh, was coming up and that uh, he'd think it would be great for the viewers if we went down there. So we went down uh, last year across the fence, definitely went across the fence, southern <laughs> Pennsylvania, a little bit out of our, uh, little bit out of our demographic. Um, but it, I, what I wanted to do was put together a little something so the viewers could see, um, you know, sort of how we work together and, mm -hmm. and the magic and the, the big crew that we have, uh, all two of us, right. <laughs> um, uh, to put this together. Um, I've been lucky to work with a lot of smart people uh, in my career. And when it comes to Vermont and the Civil War, Howard Coffin is brilliant. Sure, our partnership might be a little May-December, <laughs> but like any good working relationship, it's built on trust, admiration, and staying out of the other person's way. The 16th Vermont out on picket along the road. Howard Coffin is a consummate professional. He doesn't do too many retakes. He doesn't need to. But there are exceptions. On the 14th, the 14th row, four, stop it, I'm losing my. A Confederate artillery shell hit a, a, an ammunition. Oh, damn it, I lost Pick it. it. Up there. Okay, shall I start again or shall I do it? <laughs> Pretty good, pretty pretty good, I think. Yeah. Was it okay? <laughs> that was great. I've been working with Howard for over 15 years, and in that time, I'd like to think we figured a few things out. Right. Yeah. 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 Because I agree with you. Because if the weather should change, you know. They, yeah. Yeah. No. They're I, not. In, they're not indispensable. Right. No. I totally okay. agree with you. One summer night, a decade and a half ago, Howard has visited Gettysburg over a hundred times began. in the last 45 I years. I will never forget my first trip to Gettysburg. Uh, finding the first place in the battlefield I found myself on was Seminary Ridge. And I said, this isn't a ridge. This isn't a Vermont ridge. They're three or four hundred feet high. This is just a, a little rise, you know. Well, I want to lead into the Lincoln piece by saying right. that... Well, this was my first done. time visiting Gettysburg. No. And what this, I wanted to know was what draws right. visitors here, year after year, and why. There is no place like Gettysburg. It was the biggest battle of the Civil War. It had the, the great dramatic ending. Uh, there are incidents earlier in the battle that are almost as interesting as Pickett's Charge, but it had Lincoln. It had Lincoln. Lincoln came here. Lincoln, perhaps the greatest man in the history of America, particularly because I believe that he fought the Civil War because he wanted to free the slaves. Keeping the Union together was secondary to him, I think. Millions of people come here to Gettysburg every year because Lincoln was here. Oh yes, the battle is fascinating, but it was Lincoln. For Coffin, seeing one battlefield isn't nearly enough, and neither is being a passive visitor to these hallowed grounds. Having been here, you'll start going to Spotsylvania and Fredericksburg and Chickamauga and Chattanooga and Richmond and Petersburg and see those other battlefields and learn the full history and then get involved in saving the battlefields because they are endangered gems. And if we don't all get involved, they're going to be lost. Have you been here? I don't know if I will come back to Gettysburg. If I do, I know I won't have a guide as good as my collaborator, as my friend, Howard Coffin. You like that? Yep. Good. Nicely done. In Gettysburg, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, Keith and Howard now wrap up our series with an often overlooked skirmish that occurs at the very end of the Battle of Gettysburg. Vermont soldiers had proved their mettle at Pickett's Charge, but they were called on once more and were led by a brave lieutenant from Michigan, a man who, like many others, symbolizes the folly and the true cost of war.
Here's Howard Coffin in Gettysburg. It's July 3rd, 1863, the most famous day in the Battle of Gettysburg. We're here at the southern end of the battlefield. Behind me is famous Big Round Top, and to the right of it is a smaller hill that doesn't look much like a hill called Bushman's Hill. In the morning of the 3rd, Judson Kilpatrick, who commanded a cavalry division, brought one of his two brigades down here and put them up on Bushman's Hill. In that brigade was the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry, the 1st West Virginia Cavalry, and the 1st Vermont Cavalry. They stayed up on that hill watching the goings on to the north that included Pickett's Charge. And when the battle to most people seemed over, then Kilpatrick went into action. We're now at the foot of Bushman's Hill, a steep and very rocky eminence, not a place to be riding horses down. Behind me is a very familiar statue, the statue of Major William Wells, 1st Vermont Cavalry. There's a replica of this statue in Burlington's Battery Park. Late on the 3rd of July, after all the action took place to the north, Judson Kilpatrick decided that he had a chance to roll up the Confederate line from south to north, and he decides to make a cavalry attack. His initial attack will come down this hill behind me. It will consist of Pennsylvania and West Virginia cavalry, and they will ride out into the woods and fields ahead of me to attack the Confederates there, and there were plenty of them. The stone walls, the fences that you see today at Gettysburg, thanks to the accuracy of the National Park, are usually in the places where they were at the time of the battle. I'm sitting here along the base of Bushman's Hill, looking out at farm fields owned by a family named Slider. Judson Kilpatrick decided that he should have his men attack through those fields against the southern end of the Confederate line. But there were Texas infantry and Alabama infantry, and they rose up and fired volleys. There was brisk fighting as the Union soldiers broke through that line. But then there were more infantry to the north, and soon these attacking soldiers were under artillery fire from up around the Slider Farm and from over near the Emmitsburg Road. Soon, the West Virginians and the Pennsylvanians were in retreat and they rolled all the way back here and back up onto Bushman Hill. But Kill Cavalry Kilpatrick, that was his nickname, wasn't through by any means. He was going to roll up that Confederate line and now he ordered Brigade Commander Elon Farnsworth to take the 1st Vermont Cavalry and try again. Farnsworth said, I'm not so sure this can be done. There's a lot of Confederates out there. The ground isn't good. Boulders out there. Kilpatrick said, well, take a look. And Farnsworth rode out there and scouted. And when he came back, he said, no, I don't think it can be done. Kilpatrick said, you're going to do it. Farnsworth said it would be suicidal. Kilpatrick said something to affect that he tested Farnsworth's honor and courage, and Farnsworth said, all right, I'll do it, and he took command of the charge that would be made by the Vermonters. To make the charge, the Vermonters formed their 600 men into three battalions. One was commanded by the regimental commander from Danville, Addison Preston, one battalion commanded by William Wells, and one battalion, the largest, commanded by Captain Henry Parsons from St. Albans. Addison Preston brought his battalion down and they lined up, dismounted along this fence and stone wall that's adjacent to it. They would provide covering fire. Now Wells and Parsons would try to break through to the Slider Farm and hopefully even north to Devil's Den. 
The order was given, down the hill the Vermonters came, and as soon as they went into that field, they were hit too by heavy fire from the Texans and Alabamians, but on they went. We're looking down on the slider farm from the high ground that leads up toward the Emmitsburg Road. Into the fields around the slider farm came riding the Vermonters under Captain Parsons and Major Wells. Taking fire all the time from small arms, there was even some hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then they came under fire from artillery. Artillery by the Emmitsburg Road, artillery to the north up near Devil's Den. It became hopeless, a melee, and the Vermonters decided it was time to get away. Some came riding in this direction, then going south back toward Bushman's Hill. Wells and Farnsworth headed east to the other slider field, hoping to get out that way, riding toward Little Round Top. After the wild fighting around the slider farm, the Vermonters' attack began to disintegrate. Farnsworth reached this stone wall, leaped his horse over it, and as he did so, he was hit by a fusillade of Confederate bullets, and down he went. The shots came from over at the base of Round Top, and they were delivered by some tough soldiers. The men of William C. Oates, 15th Alabama, who the previous day had won fame with a valiant attempt to take Little Round Top from Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's 20th Maine. Farnsworth was down and mortally wounded. The Confederates came over to him, saw that he was severely wounded. Elon Farnsworth was gone and the Vermonters were saddened. The Vermonters thought the world of Elon Farnsworth. Oh yes, he was a Michigander. Oh yes, he had enlisted in an Illinois outfit. But after he led their brigade, they came to learn that he was fearless and a great cavalry commander. And he had just been promoted to Brigadier General two days before he died. In 1889, the Vermonters, veterans of the cavalry regiment, came back to Gettysburg and dedicated a monument to themselves right here on the spot where Farnsworth died. Judson Kilpatrick got the Vermonters blame for the debacle here, this useless, deadly cavalry charge. But he even came to Vermont well after the war and was given a hero's welcome at a reunion in Cambridge, Vermont. But the Vermonters' cost of all this had been high. 65 Vermonters became casualties that day in that cavalry charge. About 20 of them died, some 30 of them ended up in rebel prisons where some of more of them passed away. With the tragic end of Kilpatrick's charge and Farnsworth dead, the fighting at Gettysburg comes to an end. Three days, including the fighting west of town, Little Round Top, Big Round Top, the Peach Orchard Cemetery Ridge, it all ends here. Lee would stay in position for another day and then quietly in the night begin his retreat back to Virginia, admitting defeat, going back to fight another day and soon the Vermont cavalry and the other Vermont units would be in pursuit of the victorious Army of the Potomac. For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.